Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CILE Academy and our guest lecture for this week by Ms. Elizabeth Marumamrema on nature and people reducing biodiversity loss to ensure the planet's future. Please allow me to now pass you over to the co-director of the E Academy and our CIL director, Dr. Nilifer Oral. Thank you, thank you so much, Zue. Well, um, we're really so fortunate to have as our guest lecture this week, um, uh, Elizabeth Marema, who is the current executive secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, she was, uh, she has an incredible uh, history. She's been with the United Nations Environmental Program for many years and has served in different um, capacities um, from, in, as well as in 2009, she was appointed as executive secretary of the um, UNIP Secretariat of the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals. Also, she was acting executive secretary of the UNIP ASCOBAMS and also for the UNIP Gorilla Agreement. Um, but I know uh, Elizabeth from her time as um, director of the legal division of the uh, UNIP, uh, UNIP uh, legal uh, office. And we had uh, Arnold Krubiner yesterday um, who worked with Elizabeth very closely. Um, but Elizabeth really is someone who brings an incredible amount of knowledge and experience, um, both in uh, environmental law, but also diplomacy and working with states and governments. Um, and I have to say, she's also a supporter of IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, where together we are members of the steering committee. I won't take any more time because there's much more I can say about Elizabeth, but I think she has more important things to tell us about biodiversity uh, and her work. Elizabeth, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Nelofa, thank you. Thank you very much. First, my sincere thanks for this invitation. Uh, and. Uh, a privilege for me, and I've been joined by, by my colleague also, Thomas, uh, to share with you uh, some of the uh, critical issues going on in our field of uh, our work, particularly on nature and biodiversity. And as had been indicated, my topic with you will be nature and people, reducing biodiversity loss to ensure the planet's future. Humanity and the planet are at crossroads. Never, I <coughs> uh, beg your pardon. I see the presentation messing up with me. Never in the history of mankind have we faced a crisis of this magnitude with such daunting consequences. While we stand in solidarity with governments and people everywhere as they fight COVID-19 and its procession of deaths, diseases, and suffering, we can only recognize that this pandemic is, although a terrible one, but just one another lens showing us that the current situation demands immediate action. Fortunately, that action is only on nature and biodiversity. The most recent report from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, abbreviated IPBS, has clearly highlighted what were the primary and secondary drivers of biodiversity loss. Sadly, all of these are as a result of human activities and all have been recognized as very high risk factors for the potential emergency, re-emergency and the spread of infectious diseases. We should not be surprised that we are all suffering now with the pandemic. Knowing that approximately two thirds or 60% of non-human infectious diseases as zoonotic, and that over the last 60 years, majority of the new zoonotic pathogens have emerged largely as the result of human activities. Consequently, we need to realize 
that humanity is placing too many pressures on the natural world and failing to take care of the planet clearly means not taking care of ourselves. So we need to know upfront that our own actions, daily actions, have a major impact on nature and biodiversity and in turn, the pandemic for which, which is with us currently. So COVID-19 began as a healthy crisis but has quickly transformed into a developmental crisis in the sense that it clearly revealed that health, economic, social, environmental disasters need to be tackled and cannot be tackled in isolation from each other. On the contrary, lessons learned over the years from the pandemics show that the preventing and fighting them requires concerted global actions and solidarity supported by long-term vision of prevention. This long-term vision calls for fundamental transformation of our relationship with the natural world or nature. And indeed, only by doing so, we will be able to reduce the risks of the risk of witnessing emergency of new pandemics in future. Environmental law has therefore a major role to play in this transformation and Convention on Biological Diversity aims to play its part for the benefit of the planet and the people. In this lecture with you, I would like to assess the current strategic plan for biodiversity uh, that unfortunately has not been able to guarantee the preservation and restoration of nature. Then I will review the ongoing negotiations for the post, new post-2020 global biodiversity framework and its content. And then I will end with how the protection of biological diversity impacts all aspects of human life. For lack of time, or for obvious reasons, I would like to assume that the content of the Convention on Biological Diversity and its two protocols, the Biosafety Protocol and Access and Benefit Sharing Protocols are already known to the audience. And therefore, I will avoid uh, repeating or talking about the content of these instruments directly in this talk. So let me begin by look, assessing the 2011-2020 strategic plan and the Aichi Biodiversity Targets, which actually has been uh, uh, in operation, not just for the Secretariat, but also for all parties, 196, so virtually universal in the last 10 years to the end of this year. The program of work for the convention derives from the treaties and is adopted by the conference of the parties to the convention or the meeting of the parties to the two protocols as our governing bodies. The, both the, convention, the conference of the parties and the meeting of the parties meet every two years. And we should have been meeting actually now, this week, uh, but unfortunately for reasons all known to us, this has not happened. The long-term program of work of the convention is therefore guided by this 10 years strategic plan on biodiversity. And the current plan accompanied by now the famous 20 IH biodiversity targets both ought to be met by the end of this year, basically in the next two months uh, period. The plan, strategic plan, is guided by an overarching long-term vision of living in harmony with nature, where by 2050, biodiversity will be valued, conserved, restored, and wisely used while maintaining ecosystem services and sustaining a healthy planet, ensuring it delivers benefits essential for all the people. So you are the people. 2020, 2011, 2020 strategic plan 
plus the 28 biodiversity targets have helped to foster global action in favor of biodiversity. And in conjunction with the implementation of the plan, hundreds of projects have been conducted by countries to support this implementation. Some targets have uh, seen some progress and a major target, particularly target 11 of protected areas, which complements sustainable development goals 14.5, uh, target 14.5 for meeting 17% of terrestrial areas and 10% of marine areas, fingers crossed, may be met before the end of this year. So good news there. However, at the last IPBS Global Assessment Report, our fifth Global Biodiversity Outlook launched only last month, mid-September as well as other recent reports have unequivocally shown that it is clear that probably none of the 20 Aichi biodiversity targets will be fully met by the end of December this year. Some progress has been achieved, but only on few of them, specifically only six. Unfortunately, if we were to use a scorecard as a barometer to assess, even these six still progress is made at a very low percentage, basically below 30%, so not good. Many reasons exist to explain why biodiversity regime has not been able to deliver on the 2011-2020 strategic plan and the Aichi biodiversity targets. The current status of biodiversity and the risks that the situation is creating for our societies make it necessary to understand the reasons why we are not reaching the Aichi biodiversity targets and be able to overcome as we move forward to a better future for the people and the planet. May, if I may go to the reasons, one, Many of the countries began implementation of the strategic plan and the Aichi targets only after three to five years into the decade, making actually the practical period of the decade's implementation to only half of a decade and not a full expected decade. Why? Most countries first took a step back to review, develop, and update their uh, national biodiversity strategies and action plans. And on the IH biodiversity target scorecards, indeed, progress had been made there because over 170 countries have had their national biodiversity strategies and action plans redone during this period, increasing actually to about 85% of our convention parties. So great progress, but unfortunately, this then delayed the start in the period of the implementation during the decade. Two, there was an assumption that the IH biodiversity targets were to be implemented by governments alone through the ministries and departments of environment, forgetting that nature biodiversity is for everybody, you and me, and all stakeholders needed to be engaged on a whole of government, whole of society approach to be able to meet the different targets. As a result, not all stakeholders had been fully engaged, not just in the development of the targets to be able to own them, but also missed in their implementation. So we saw weak engagement, or hardly any engagement from the business sector, the industry, the finance, the youth, the indigenous peoples and local communities, and other sectors of the economy, such as agriculture, fisheries, planning, and finance, to mention but a few. Three, the Aichi targets, when they were adopted, it was the targets were not accompanied with a review, monitoring, reporting 
mechanism or framework uh, which will have enabled the countries to assess periodic progress of implementation with indicators which we are missing to be able then to, to track progress. Equally, it was assumed that when the targets were adopted, all countries were on the same level of development and thus all will have been able to implement the Aichi biodiversity targets on their own without the resources <coughs> or capacity development needed to assist those in need. Although during the decade, international financial flows for biodiversity doubled, unfortunately, that was still inadequate to satisfy the needed demands. If only the 500 million US dollars spent yearly into unsustainable biodiversity services, particularly on fossil fuel, oil and gas, or expanding swatches of agricultural land for production and unsustainable infrastructure. And if this amount of resources were contributed and to incentivize and reversing biodiversity loss would have reached far today. But unfortunately, that had not been the case. Additionally, as we all know, environmental law globally, and is no different in the case of the Aichi biodiversity targets, suffers from the chronic defect of lack of or inadequate implementation and enforcement at all levels. And therefore, coming to the targets, that had not been different. Finally, but not least, it has become evident in the recent years that climate change, biodiversity loss, oceanic pollution, and acidification, desertification, and health impacts, for instance, as the result of COVID-19, among other issues, are all intrinsically interconnected. Consequently, global transformation and solidarity to tackle these multiple challenges are needed to be in a holistic, integrated whole of government, whole of society. And they become therefore condition sine qua non for halting and reversing biodiversity loss while at the same time enhancing climate change mitigation and adaptation. So having given this unfortunately gloomy picture, what then are the plans moving forward as we develop the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which will replace uh, the Aichi biodiversity targets? The post-20 framework uh, is expected to be adopted hopefully now next year at our next conference of the parties, which will be held in Kuming, China. One, unlike the Aichi biodiversity target, will be universal in its application and implementation. And therefore, it is currently being negotiated, not just by the parties alone, but with the contribution of all stakeholders. And I mean all, be the youth, be the finance, be the business, all. And consequently, its final content, uh, or, but of course now we are yet to ascertain its final content because negotiations still continue. However, many elements already appear in the recently released updated zero draft, uh, showing that negotiators are really trying to build on the experience gained on the implementation of the coming to an end strategic biodiversity plan and the Aichi biodiversity targets. Negotiations are therefore grounded on science and especially on the findings of the latest IPBS global assessment published May last year. They recently launched our fifth global biodiversity outlook uh, uh, published by the secretariat plus other relevant reports. Parties to the convention have made it very clear uh, during their last uh, uh, conference of the parties in 2018 that the new framework 
will need to be accompanied by an inspirational, motivating 2030 vision, aligning with 2030 agenda for sustainable development, and serve as a stepping stone towards achieving our 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. It therefore builds on a strategic plan uh, of the 2011-2020 and aims at attaining it in the long-term vision, the 2050. In its current state, the draft framework proposes a simplified 2030 mission for the framework, which currently says to take urgent action across all society to put biodiversity on a path to recovery for the benefit of the planet and the people. The objective therefore is to develop a framework that is simpler and more action oriented. Various commitments by stakeholders, made by stakeholders, including business and finance sectors, as well as pledges and pronouncements by the world leaders, particularly recently through the series of Nature for Life Hub events, as well as the UN Biodiversity Summit, all held at the end of last month, clearly take this direction of action. The draft framework is therefore built around goals to be achieved by 2050, but milestones to be realized by 2030, and therefore aligning itself very well with the achievements of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. So the objectives of such milestones will be one, to ensure we can measure and slow progress towards the 2030 milestones and 2050 goals. Two, to ensure we can evaluate if the action targets are the right tools to meet the 2050 vision. So in its current state, uh, it has four main pillars, which hopefully will take us to 2030 and beyond to 2050. One, to reduce threats to ecosystems, species, and genetic diversity. Two, to ensure that nature meets the people's needs. Three, to ensure that benefits will be shared fairly and equitably, and four, to ensure availability of the means of implementation to enhance parties' capacities to implement the framework. The draft framework therefore intends to galvanize urgent and transformative action of the whole of government, all of society, including indigenous peoples and local communities, civil society, the business, and everybody to be able to achieve the outcomes it sets out in its vision, mission, goals, and targets. To do so, the draft develops a change of paradigm, insisting on global transformative action. Accordingly, it is supported by theory of change underlining the entire framework. Building on the lessons from the Aichi Biodiversity Targets, it is also envisaged that the framework will be accompanied by a review, monitoring, and reporting mechanism. It will also be accompanied by a resource mobilization strategy, as well as a long-term strategic plan for capacity building and technology transfer. This is very important since without these elements, it may not be possible to periodically monitor the global implementation of the framework and to be able to track progress, which we have learned from the current IHE targets. The framework also intends to promote synergies and coordination with different relevant processes, including the protocols, as well as other biodiversity related conventions and other global regional instruments. It is hoped as we, as was the case with the current biodiversity strategic plan, 
other relevant conventions will equally align their strategies and plans with the new global biodiversity framework when it is adopted, after it is adopted. Furthermore, the development of the framework guarantees that all stakeholders, including yourselves, academia, the civil society, the youth, business, indigenous people, local communities, who are all contributing to the ongoing process and various iteration, iterations of the draft are participating in this development of the framework. One of the positive impacts of the postponement induced by the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been this additional time that we have been given to further undertake different uh, extensive ritual consultations with multiple stakeholders in addition to the parties and therefore building on the principles of participation, transparency and inclusiveness as decided by the parties and ensuring that no one is left behind. So my discussions with you uh, this evening or my morning, uh, our morning is exactly geared towards that direction. Results of this such global participation are already visible as we are seeing or we have already seen over 560 companies with combined revenue of over $4 trillion per, per year, US dollars per year, while committing and pledging to take action on nature, have also called upon governments to adopt policies and create an enabling environment to urgently hold and reverse nature loss before the planet perish in front of our own eyes. The UN Biodiversity Summit was yet another proof of this engagement of actors, whereby over 150 governments registered, including 72 at the level of heads of state and government, along with chief executive officers of many companies and other stakeholders. And in addition, 75 governments, including the European Union, signing a leader's pledge for nature. So clearly, action is on the ground. Our common objective is therefore to ensure that the global biodiversity framework is relevant, not only to the conservation of nature, but also to the achievement of sustainable development goals and sound implementation of the convention and its protocols, as well as other biodiversity related conventions. So let's look at how do we move beyond biodiversity conservation and the impact that our actions have on biodiversity or nature. Let me begin by biodiversity, food and uh, alimentation. It is clearly now acknowledged that biodiversity is the foundation of human life. So our lives, your life will, be, will perish if not for biodiversity, because biodiversity provides us, provides the plants, the animals that form the basis of agriculture and the immense variety within each crop and livestock species. And in turn, agriculture provides us human with the food we eat, the raw materials for the goods like cotton, linen for clothing, wood for shelter and fuel, materials for biofuels. It gives us the air we breathe, the water we drink and consume, as well as the incomes and the livelihood to just mention the few benefits, clearly foundation of life. At the same time, Food production, consumption patterns, and changes in land use have been recognized as some of the drivers and serious drivers of biodiversity loss. The 2019 IPBS Global Assessment Report opened our eyes that agricultural and industrial ex expansion has led to a loss of 
85% of wetlands uh, <coughs> has altered 75% of land surface and has impacted 66% of the ocean area. Similarly, the IPBS report has considered as well established that expanding trade means consumption affects the degradation of biodiversity and ecosystem. And therefore, food production and uh, agriculture have become very important topics in the biodiversity negotiations and also considered serious by the business and finance sectors because they also pose risks to their business uh, by as the result of biodiversity loss and land degradation. Accordingly, the, conventions the convention collaborates with food and agriculture organization on issues related to agriculture and livestock matters, which are of essential importance to secure the food security and ensure adequate nutrition, stable livelihoods for all of us on one side, while on the other side, conserving and ensuring sustainable use of biological diversity. Let's look at biodiversity and health. Biological diversity tremendously equally supports human health as being a direct source of most of our modern pharmacopoeia uh, or medicines. The evidence of the links between biodiversity and human health, or rather human health and health and resilience of nature is today unquestionable. Yet, all the drivers of biodiversity loss are also very high risk factors for the potential emergency and spread of diseases. And COVID-19 is with us exactly for that reason. The continuing loss of biodiversity on the global scale thus represents a direct threat to our health and well-being. Indeed, on one side, it increased the risk of emergency and spread of infectious diseases. But on the other side, biodiversity loss also limits the discovery of potential treatments as nature is the source of several types of medicines, including antibiotics. On the contrary, health and functioning ecosystems will also ensure that nature's control on zoonotic pathogens is restored and will nourish pharmacological research and therefore allowing us a better prevention and response to pandemics and therefore better protection of human health and therefore also thus reducing the huge cost and national investments put on our healthcare and healthy systems. For many years, the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity has been working closely with the Health World Health Organization and other partners under our joint work program on biodiversity and health, resulting into currently a development of ongoing draft global plan of action on biodiversity and health. Furthermore, and most recently, at our last conference of the parties, 2018, parties adopted a biodiversity inclusive One Health guidance. The guidance that seeks to assist countries in implementing a more integrated, interdisciplinary, cross-sectorial approaches for the delivery of multiple benefits to health and well-being. Through well-defined, ambitious, and measurable targets. Post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework will therefore provide the legal basis to support restoring nature's own control over the zoonotic pathogen. In this regard, it will be important uh, step forward in the prevention of pandemic while ensuring conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. Looking at the relationship between biodiversity and sustainable development goals. The protection of biological diversity is likewise a key element 
to the realization of the sustainable development goals. Two of the sustainable development goals primarily focus on biological diversity, particularly SDG 14 on uh, conservation, sustainable use uh, of oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development, and SDG 15 on the protection and restoration and promotion of the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystem, sustainable and management of forest, combating desertification, halting and reversing land degradation and biodiversity loss. Needless to say, we also need to understand that 14 of the 17 sustainable development goals have biodiversity related elements in them, clearly indicating the importance of biodiversity conservation and its protection to the achievement of the majority of the sustainable development goals and inevitably SDGs or the 17 SDGs cannot be achieved without the biodiversity contribution in to the 14 uh, targets uh, goals related to it. Consequently, the draft framework under consideration provides the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, which will also contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation and disaster risk reduction through nature-based solutions, among other solutions. It is thus proposes that the post 2020 framework contributes equally to the efforts to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement on climate change. Therefore, in view of the connected interconnectedness between biodiversity loss and climate change, the convention directly protects the achievement of SDG 14 on the urgent action to be taken to combat climate change and its impact. At the same time, through their respective program of work, cooperation developed with other environmental conventions, as well as other international organizations, such as FAO, as I had mentioned, and WHO, and other uh, related conventions, CITES, CMS, and others, all have directly uh, also support achievement of different targets. Look at SDG 1 on poverty eradication, SDG 2 on hunger, food security, nutrition, sustainable agriculture, SDG 3 on healthy lives uh, and well being for all ages, SDG 6 on sustainable management of water and sanitation for all, SDG 11 on safe, resilient, sustainable cities and human settlement, and SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production. All these will not be reached without dealing with halting and reversing biodiversity loss. So the interconnection of the various SDGs and other multilateral environmental agreements are fully taken into account into the, in the updated zero draft of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The draft recognizes that the theory of change developed is complementary to aligned and aligned to and supportive to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It takes into account long-term strategies and targets of other multilateral agreements, and these are particularly biodiversity-related Rio conventions, but also chemical conventions to ensure synergy delivery of the benefits for all, uh, from all agreements for the planet and the people. Meanwhile, the convention strategy for gender mainstreaming also supports in the realm of biodiversity, the achievement of SDG 5 on gender equality. A new draft gender action plan is currently being prepared to mainstream gender equity and equality also into the post-2020 framework and therefore contributing to SDG 5 and related targets. Lastly, 
let's look at biodiversity and human rights. I know a dear topic for many lawyers. Going even further, the protection of biodiversity and maintenance of healthy ecosystems are similarly key to enjoying broad range of human rights. Today, more than two thirds of the world's countries have introduced language relating to environment in their national constitution. And 51 of these constitutions include specific provisions on wild species and ecosystem. Furthermore, hundreds of pieces of legislation have also been adopted on environment. For instance, we know more than 100 states have enacted legislation that specifically identifies and articulates as the right to a healthy environment, including both procedural and substantive elements. Conversely, the implementation of the Convention on Biological Diversity equally contributes immensely to the implementation of human rights principles and framework. Indeed, the fight against biodiversity loss protects agriculture in the form of protecting pollinators and therefore supports human rights to food. When we look at prevention of pollution, whether caused by waste or chemicals, protects the right to access to, of clean water, among others. Or protection of the atmosphere on the, of biodiversity, whereby modern medical research and uh, uh, pharmacopoeia relies, protects the right to, life, to health. Through these various means, therefore, environmental law, including biodiversity law, contributes immensely towards the right to life, which need to be exercised through the right to a clean and healthy environment. The global protection of the environment, therefore, participates and is to some extent equally a condition sine qua non to the full enjoyment of rights that have long been protected and safeguarded at different levels by national laws, international treaties and covenants, regional conventions, uh, uh, and many others uh, across the, the world. The same is true uh, for a body of national, regional, and international jurisprudence on human rights uh, courts and other courts. The convention regime has additionally recognized and integrated since its inception the specific situation of indigenous peoples and local communities through its Article 8J on traditional knowledge. Not only that, the convention has a standing ad hoc working group on Article 8J and related provisions dedicated to the implementation of this article and uh, enhancement of the role and involvement of indigenous peoples and local communities in the achievements of the objectives of the convention. The work of this working group plus the engagement of its constituents fully participates and engaged in the development of the post-2020 global framework. Let me conclude with few points. What we have seen that uh, basically what I've talked about leads us to few conclusions. One, post-2020 global biodiversity framework constitutes a turning point, not only for the Convention on Biological Diversity, but for the social, economic, and development agenda, our own well-being, and indeed the well-being of the planet. Two, as we discussed, the loss of biological diversity will have far-reaching consequences on access to clean water, food, natural supplies, medicines, as well as on the enjoyment of human rights and intergenerational equity, as well as impacts of infectious and zoonotic diseases. Three, the current update, updated zero draft 
of the post 2020 framework and the engagement of the parties and all other stakeholders in the process seem to indicate that the issues encountered in the implementation of the current strategic plan and the IH biodiversity targets have been clearly analyzed and understood. Subsequently, efforts are being made to overcome them by urging and calling for a new hall of government, hall of society, and one health approach to transform our development models and achieve sustainable development, especially during the post-COVID-19 economic recovery programs, including the stimulus packages, ensuring there will be more greener and sustainable. Four, the partnerships needed to implement the ambitious biodiversity, uh, I mean, post-2020 global biodiversity framework are in place. And although improvements can always be sought, they have already produced positive results and more are envisaged. Five, and lastly, in the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic and the appeals from the UN Secretary General to aim for green recovery and building back better, it appears that post 2020 is the both the path to prevent emergency of future new and emergence of infectious diseases, but also a clear marked road towards sustainable development and a greener future for all life on earth, leaving no one uh, behind. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. You gave us such a clear uh, explanation. Um, one, I think I've never heard of this clear, of one, the IG uh, Strategic Action Plan. Um, particularly, I found it um, very important to understand what worked and what um, the experience shows, shall we say, lessons learned. The post-2020, which obviously many things have been learned in the last decade, that the approach is quite different, very comprehensive. But I think also you've made such a compelling case for why biodiversity is so critical. It is the foundation of life and it touches everything we do. And you weave that just masterly through each and every one of those SDGs. Um, so I think um, I won't go on because I know we have a couple of questions, uh, but thank you so much. Uh, I think that for our participants and our general audience, this was really a masterclass uh, on the biodiversity. <laughs> Impossible. Really, no, absolutely. I say that with, with all sincerity. All right, so I know we have a question. Um, let's see, hold on. Tomas, did you want to? Yes, I can do that if you want, Nila, first. So, Elizabeth, there was first uh, um, actually a double question from Olga. The first one was, given the failure of reaching the IT targets or SDGs to date, how CBD plans to guarantee that the new framework of implementation will be an effective one? And the second part of the question was, how do you see the role of international law in implementing the post-2020 framework? I can, of course, support you in answering if you want. Yes, I will begin, but I have uh, an expert more than myself, uh, Thomas, will help me. Let me begin with the first question. Indeed, uh, we have failed or we are failing with the IH biodiversity target. And as I had indicated, we have learned the lessons. We know why we are failing and we are building those lessons into the new framework. One key which we'll all need to, uh, to notice particularly has been the involvement of the stakeholders who had been silent partners, but probably contributing immensely into, bio, uh, into the biodiversity loss, agricultural production. And when we talk of agricultural production, we are not talking of small farmers. We are talking industrial agricultural production, the big farmers. And this is where the business comes in. 
the food systems comes in. And now having the over 550 companies pledging and making commitment to take action because they've also realized that 50% of the global GDP actually highly or moderately depends on nature. So equally, even business is at risk of losing $44 trillion per year for not taking care of nature. Not surprising that we are seeing more and more business coming on board. Indigenous peoples and local communities, you all know how this part of the community has been affected uh, where their lands are being taken, uh, for development and the like, and simply because of not being engaged in some of this decision-making process, which is now happening, as I've alluded. The youth, we are seeing youth demonstrating globally, everywhere. Clearly, the youth voice has become a voice which can no longer be ignored, because the youth are the ones who will implement all the decisions we are taking today, many of us will have exist from the earth if not retired, but the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. So they are demanding to also be listened and take part in the decision making, to be ready, to be accounted when they will come uh, during their days to implement. So, and the commitments, pronouncements made by Virtually 72 heads of state and government on 30th September at the UN summit clearly gives us that hope of political will, action to be taken, and leaders have basically been saying we should not wait for post-2020. Action already needs to be taken now because the we are already in climate and biodiversity crisis now. Pandemic has taught us the lesson. We have encroached on the natural world we, because of expansion of agriculture, because of deforest, uh, uh, deforestation. We have encroached the wild spaces and interfered with the peace of the wild animals and affected even the local communities who have habited harmoniously and sustainably uh, with these uh, wild species because of our selfish demands. Again human selfish actions. We are the most dangerous species on world today. On the second question, yes, international law uh, probably has been the biggest uh, or the weakest uh, tool of enforcement when it comes to international law. And I think the, the, the strengthening of the role of uh, international law will depend also on the strengthening of the implementation of different conventions and treaties which exist today. The world is not short of legal frameworks. It is short of implementation and enforcement. We do not need new instruments. If we are able to ensure the existing ones are effectively implemented, we will be in a different world. And post 2020, we'll be looking forward to that. That's why I talked of, uh, we hope that when the, with the engagement of the parties of all other international treaties who are parties to the convention, engagement of all stakeholders, then other treaties will be able to align themselves also with the post 2020 when adopted, just the way we are aligning ourselves with the SDGs sustainable development goals, so that we are not adding on, but aligning with the existing adopted global goals and ensure the effective uh, implementation and enforcement. Back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, just to add, I totally agree with everything you said, and, and um, I will not add anything to the answer you made to the first question, just to add maybe some purely legal things on the second question, the role of international law, you also have to understand, Olga, that the, uh, the CBD itself, the Secretariat, is not so much of a, of a legal agency or uh, 
a, a UN entity that's supposed to do enforcement of international law. But there are still many tools that we can use. And it depends if you take the point of view from internally to the Secretariat or externally. Internally, we can't do much, but what we can do is spread the message across in various uh, UN entities, various resolutions, and have elements put on resolutions adopted at the UN, at the uh, UN Environmental Assembly, and, and in other bodies. The other tool that we can use is, like Elizabeth said in her presentation, is building synergies between various international bodies to make sure that the message goes across and that maybe other bodies with stronger enforcement tools will include elements that will be beneficial to the CBD. But if you place yourself, let's say, externally in a purely international law view, then there are many things going going further that could actually impact the implementation of the post-2020. You have the whole debate on the implementation of COP decisions and the question of soft law versus hard law. You have the whole question of the development of environmental uh, litigation and human rights litigation benefiting uh, the environmental sphere. And all of this could actually impact the implementation of the framework without obviously originating from the work of the CBD Secretariat. So that's element that surely will be taken into account over time by the parties in negotiations, even if it's not something that we developed ourselves. It just exists in the international law and could impact um, our work. Elizabeth, there is another question from Diane on um, the specific question of the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So the question more specifically is, uh, to hear your thoughts on how to bridge the interest between developed and developing countries on the sharing of benefits of uh, biological diversity, but in the BBNG area and BBNG negotiations. Thank you very much. Indeed, negotiations are still going on, but I think we need to understand in any negotiations, there are different interests and interest because each party, each country would, would wish to gain the maximum benefit from an international uh, treat or international mechanism. And this is what exactly is happening with BBNJ. We know that most of the genetic resources are in the developing world. While the developed world will wish to see a free access of those resources to be able to make let's say the medicines, the antibiotics, uh, and what have you. But of course, the developing world want to ensure with that free access, how do they get the benefits back? Because they are the ones conserving the resources for those who come to harvest the resources to be able to make other materials. But then how will the, ben how will the benefits be guaranteed that will get back, particularly to the communities producing those uh, genetic uh, diversity materials. And these are not simple questions uh, to be handled. And of course, in negotiation, uh, it becomes a bit theoretical when I will say, yes, Thomas, I will ensure you get 10 tons uh, or 20, uh, 20 million. Uh, from what I will take. I'm not sure how much I will get first, and therefore, and how that also will be measured. And therefore, you will find in the negotiations, uh, which is the case also when you look at the access and benefit sharing protocol, issues of prior informed consent coming in for the access uh, can be guaranteed. Because by that prior informed consent, the consent giver will want to ensure also how they will be able to gain and access the benefits from it. So I can only say it's not a straight question. It's a matter at the end of give and take and compromises uh, and a lot of compromise. This also explains the, the delicacy the negotiations going on on BBNJ. But I think Nifula, who is an expert on marine matters, can also help us on this matter. Uh, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, it, as you said, this is uh, not an easy question. It's a difficult one, and one that is now being 
um, looked at in the negotiations for BBNJ, and I'm sure Dion um, is following this closely. And um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, right, where we seem to be at the final post, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're now waiting in suspense. This is going to be one of the most um, challenging parts of the negotiations. And it is because the developed countries, uh, the developing countries have a great interest um, in ensuring that they will obtain the benefits. Uh, but there are also uh, from marine genetic resources, but um, there are also challenges, not just political, but technical challenges as well. Um, so I don't want to go on, but happy to talk to Dion later on more about this. <laughs> Thank you. Elizabeth, there is another question from uh, Francisco, um, who is asking how the concept of common concern of humankind, which has been quoted in various uh, CBD negotiations or decision, is helping the post-2020 biodiversity agenda, whether it is a mere political aspiration or does it have some legal significance? Good question. Uh, I know there are a lot of arguments uh, legally on the significance uh, of the concept or principle. Thomas will remind me, but uh, I think so far uh, as a concept, it has not yet come in the discussions related with the post 2020, but you know negotiations still continue. Common but differentiated responsibility has come up on and on and out, uh, I mean, off and on, but not yet as a discussion point, but is an issue or both are concepts which we have at our back of our mind uh, in the sense that not surprising that they may be raised as negotiations get geared up uh, into looking particularly at the current post uh, uh, updated zero draft. But as it is so far, uh, it has not come up as an issue, but Thomas can correct me. No, I, I totally agree with you to, to answer Francisco on this, on this question. It's something that we've heard about. You can hear sometimes a party using a language referring to the concept of con common concern of humankind. But my humble opinion would be that it's more a way to sort of phrase the idea of common interest, of common good, or the interest of the international community. All of this is the same idea of common good, but let's say in political terms. And my opinion is that the idea to develop the concept of common concern of humankind is, is to try to sort of transform the idea of common good into, into some sort of legal principle that could be embedded uh, over time in the various yeah. regimes, and therefore sort of to trying to make it become binding to make sure that it can influence in a particular direction the development of uh, the COP decisions and the frameworks and, and other. So it could become a, a legal principle in the future. My understanding at the moment, at least on our side, is that it's not that it's not there yet. And definitely in the post 2020 negotiations, we haven't seen it coming on, on the table so far. Um, Elizabeth, the next, next question is from Angus, and who is asking, is it correct that some countries would be subject to greater scrutiny under the CBD compared to others, given that countries are not equally biodiverse? I will say no, uh, and we uh, CBD negotiations operate on consensus. So nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And uh, so far in the CBD negotiations, I won't say uh, there is, unlike in climate change where there is a compliance mechanism, in CBD, uh, we have compliance mechanism in the protocol, but not on the convention uh, uh, framework itself. But even in the protocol, the compliance mechanism is intended to help and support countries to comply. And like in the, uh, in the climate change where it includes a branch uh, of coercive sanction measures uh, or where in CITES they can have also sanction uh, on trade, not in CBD yet and neither in the compliance mechanism under the biosafety protocol, which is basically to support 
the capacity of the countries to comply and not to sanction. There was a second part to this question, which was, uh, what are the interstate dynamics in the CBD negotiations? If I may use post-2020 negotiations so far, I would say collaboratively, openness, transparency, and inclusive. And as I had indicated in my talk, when the governing body conference of the parties 2018 adopted the, uh, the decision which set up the process for the negotiation uh, of the post-2020, it also adopted a number of principles which had to be borne in mind in the process, which included participation, transparency, inclusiveness, uh, the universality, including everybody, leaving no one behind and the like. So far that is being maintained and we hope the same spirit will continue. And, and finally, Elizabeth, the last question is from Tekau. Um, so talking about the Nagoya Protocol, we know that there are 127 parties to the Nagoya Protocol uh, to date. Some very diverse countries are not parties to the protocol yet and therefore risk biopiracy. Some parties do not have any national legislations in place uh, on uh, the access and benefit sharing to uh, genetic resources. So the question is, what are the current work conducted to improve the global implementation of the Nagoya Protocol? There is a sub-question on the link between BBNG and Nagoya, which I can read afterwards or answer if you want, uh, after you answer the main one. The main question, I think we need to consider that uh, the convention itself is 196 parties. We are only missing two, the Vatican and the US. So 127, it's almost getting there. And considering that Nagoya Protocol is the latest of the, uh, of the instruments of the convention. It's celebrating its 10 years this month, specifically on the 29th, and we are welcome to join us in the series of uh, events, virtual events during that week. Uh, so I think personally I can say it's doing well, and actually about 68 countries, if my number is correct from the Global Biodiversity uh, Outlook, already have national legal mechanisms at national level for the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. The other countries are still on a different stages. So this is where, as uh, uh, Thomas had indicated earlier, where our work as the Secretariat working closely and supporting the countries in fulfilling their uh, obligations under the, the treaties or the protocol, in this case, particular Nagoya then comes in. And we hope that will continue. But I think the progress so far is not so bad considering it's a newer treaty, uh, unlike the convention itself, which is almost 30 years. And yet we are talking of being in biodiversity loss crisis. And finally, Tekau, you had the, the follow-up question on uh, what could be the potential synergies between an ABS mechanism developed under the future BBNG instruments and the ABS regime of the Nagoya Protocol. Would you like to go, Elizabeth? Yes, and then if you can join in, since uh, I've not looked at the two that critically, but uh, the Secretariat has been uh, attending and following up the BBNJ negotiations virtually critically because it's talking of marine biodiversity, the BBNJ, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And in all these, we uh, biodiversity plays a major role. And we have a full marine biodiversity program uh, within the secretariat. Basically, that's the program which follows closely. And since in the BBNJ, we are talking also of access and benefit sharing, consequently then the uh, Nagoya protocol becomes relevant on that aspect. And I'm sure the BBNJ is equally learning from the experience of the Nagoya protocol as the negotiation continue, especially in terms of the parties to the Nagoya protocol participating in the BBNJ negotiation and ensuring that there's that complementarity between the two instruments. 
but uh, I would like uh, Thomas and even uh, Nilufe to help here. Well, it's, it's a very good question, Tekao, but it's also a little bit of a difficult one because, it, I mean, to me, this question of synergies between instruments, it's always a little bit, when they're negotiating at the stage of the negotiation, it's a bit of a question of the chicken and the egg. It's obviously extremely positive if we can build synergies right away and make sure that the two instruments actually complement each other and that they function well together, that we don't, we don't reinvent the wheel and so on and so forth. But it's also very difficult to envisage what could be the future synergy or, or functioning of the two treaties, considering that one of them is already adopted and being implemented and the other one is negotiated. So we also need to see where it's going to be the, the final result of the text of the BBNG instruments. But something that's also a good thing to take into account, in addition to the fact that, like Elizabeth said, the parties to the protocol are also negotiating this instrument, therefore they can obviously build bridges by the simple fact that they are in the room and they know the Nagoya Protocol. But it's also that in the Nagoya Protocol, you have the Article 4 on the, um, the link between the protocol itself and other instruments that would include ABS regimes. Uh, so that's also something that exists at the moment in the protocol and that can organize any future relation between the protocol and other instruments. That's what we've been um, focusing on actually on, on CBD side is making sure that whatever is being done outside of the CBD regime, but that is going to have an impact on the Nagoya protocol is actually negotiated on the way that it falls under this umbrella of the article four. And therefore either the Nagoya protocol applies or the other um, instrument will apply to the substance, but in a way, and will, will be created in a way that it complements protocol uh, objectives and not goes against them. Um, yes, and just to add, um, it is a good question, and obviously uh, there is an interlinkage, but fundamentally there's one big difference. Uh, Nagoya is really a, applies within national jurisdiction, and the BBNJ is beyond national jurisdiction, and that's a big difference because Nagoya is also protecting um, the interests through prior informed a consent of um, the developing countries. Um, so there are lessons to be learned, but I think there are also limitations for that reason. Um, so, but it's interesting to see we've had quite a few BBNJ questions. And, uh, and I know uh, one of the early debates was whether BBNJ should come under the CBD um, because it was biodiversity and of course the marine genetic resources, but ultimately um, it um, was decided to be negotiated under the law of the Sea Convention, but there's no question the need for the synergistic relationship uh, between the different conventions and biodiversity, climate change, these are cross-cutting issues and, and they have to do that. So, um, but wonderful questions. And I, and I think we've come to the end. We've actually gone a bit over time, but great questions. Fantastic lecture. And I also want to take the opportunity to introduce and thank you, Tomas, as well. Uh, Tomas is a legal officer from uh, the Secretariat, works closely with Elizabeth. But I also know uh, Tomas when he was a member of the French delegation, uh, foreign ministry uh, during the negotiations of the Paris Agreement. So he also has a great deal of experience uh, in these issues. But thank you all for attending. Uh, I think we really were very fortunate to have this very uh, insightful, informative, but can I say too, inspiring? <laughs> <It's> so, <laughs> I think, and you really, Elizabeth, gave that. Um, it's, this is not a technical issue only. This is really about life, survival, humanity, and, and, and I think you really highlighted that it's all of us. Um, and I think the, the post 2020, taking that inclusive approach will make, that's a game changer. That is transformative, bringing in industry, bringing in everyone uh, because IPBS report was a major shock. <laughs> we are not doing well. Uh, so I hope in this lecture, some of you, you know, already know this, but I certainly hope that the message is passed on uh, there's a lot to do, but we need to work together to do this because without biodiversity, we, you know, the planet will go on, but we, we will not necessarily. So thank you so much. Um, and also for you, those of you who came in a bit later than usual, 
but for Elizabeth and Tomas, it was worth it, I think, to be up a little late. So thank you so much. Thank you again, Ms. Marima, Tomas, Nilofer, um, and for everybody who's joining us uh, late in the evening. <laughs> um, so this lecture will be available online on the CIL website, and you can check there also for videos of other lectures in our eAcademy series and other events. For eAcademy participants, we'll see you tomorrow at the normal time, 4 p.m. And for everybody mm -hmm. else, goodbye, good morning, good night. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe, as well, Jerry. <laughs>